This is what they always ask when they pull you over. So in these cases, you do have to provide that information, but outside that, you do not have to talk to law enforcement, and you shouldn't if they're questioning you, unless you have a lawyer. Can I talk to a lawyer before answering? Right? This is that can you talk to a lawyer before you start answering questions. So again, we're not saying completely don't talk to the law enforcement agents, but if you are going to talk to them, you should have a lawyer present. Because a lawyer is best able to protect your rights while you're talking to the law enforcement agent. So when you want to talk, yes, you have the constitutional right to talk to a lawyer, whether or not the police tell you about that right. So if the police tell you or they don't tell you, you still have this right to talk to a lawyer before you are questioned. And law enforcement agents aren't always required to say whether you can or cannot talk to a lawyer. Once you start to talk to a lawyer, they should stop asking questions. So let's say the law enforcement, they pull you over and you start answering some questions. And then you say, I don't want to answer any more questions. I want to talk to my lawyer. The law enforcement then should stop what they're doing. And they should allow you to then contact your lawyer and talk to your lawyer. Now, it's important that if you are talking with law enforcement and they, for whatever reason, keep pushing you and keep forcing you to talk, may, and you feel as if your rights are violated, you should do some basic things. The first is you should make sure you get the name of the agency and the telephone number of any law enforcement officer who stops or visits you, and give that information to your lawyer. Again, always have a lawyer present if you're talking to law enforcement agents. Always have a lawyer present if you're talking to law enforcement agent. This is something that's very, very key and vital. And you'll see that whenever people who are very wealthy or, corp or you know, people who work for corporations and these types of individuals, they will never talk to anybody unless they first talk to their lawyer. Why? Because they understand that what they say, they will be held accountable for it. While as a community, we feel that if I haven't done anything wrong, then I can't say anything wrong to these people. And no, this is not true. Your rights can be best protected by a lawyer if you have a lawyer to help you. And then, of course, another question is, what if I speak to an officer anyway? If you speak to an officer anyway, you should realize that anything you say can and it will be used against you in the court of law. The law enforcement, their job is to find people who are criminals. Their job is to find people who are criminals. So if they're talking to you, if they pull you over, if they're engaging you, they are doing it in, in a way to see whether you're guilty of something or not. So they're going to ask you questions in a way to f make it seem as if you're guilty. This is the way law enforcement works, because they don't know if you're guilty or not. So they're trained to talk to you in a manner to get you to say something that will prove your guilt. You see, This is why a lawyer is the best sort of defense for these types of things. It should be made very clear that if lying to an officer is a crime, it's a federal crime, if you lie to an officer, this is criminal. But if you remain silent, it's, it's not, uh, and you know, if you remain silent, that is not criminal. If you don't say, any, say anything to the police officer, the police officer can't be like, well, this person, he didn't say anything, thus he must be hiding something. They, that's not how they think. If you don't say something, this is your right, you don't have to say anything. And then, of course, it's also your constitutional right to talk to a lawyer. It is something interesting that the law enforcement agent, he can lie to you. He can lie to us. So if a law enforcement agent talks to you, he can lie to you, but if you lie to him, that's a crime and that is a criminal offense. So a law enforcement agent can say, we know you've done this and we have proof of this and we have witnesses and witnesses are your cousin, your uncle, whatever it is, and they'll say their names. Why? So it's a way of trying to see whether you're guilty or not. So they can lie to you directly in your face, but you do not have the right to lie to a law enforcement officer. And anything you say, like I said, can and it will be used against you. So you should not talk to law enforcement unless you have a lawyer, right? A lawyer. Get a lawyer. You need a lawyer. Everybody gets a lawyer, so we should also get this mindset that you need a lawyer as well. Of course, you can answer some questions and refuse to answer other questions. So if a law enforcement agent comes to your house and he says, how are you doing today, right? You can say, I'm doing fine, right? I don't want our community to get paranoid and to become extreme in one direction, which is that any time a law enforcement officer comes to you, you just say, talk to my lawyer, right? A police officer might knock at your house. Excuse me, sir, have you seen this missing child? <laughs> 
here's my here, talk to my lawyer, right? We don't want to get into that sort of extreme. Somebody comes to your house, the neighbor's house is on fire, we need you to get out. <laughs> here, talk to my lawyer, right? We don't want to get in that situation, but you do have to realize that if you're being questioned by the police, they are doing so to find something that you've done, and it's the best to remain silent in that situation and ask to talk to your lawyer. Possible threats. What if the law enforcement threatens me with a grand jury subpoena if I don't answer? Right? So this is a threat that the law enforcement can give you, that they'll threaten you with something if you don't answer the question. So what is a grand jury subpoena? subpoena? It is a written order for you to go to court and testify about information that you may have. This is what a grand jury subpoena is. So if you are threatened with this, still you don't have to answer questions. The only one that can make you talk is who? The judge. Right? So if you're threatened by this, again, you still don't have to answer questions. It's just a threat. And only when they call you out on it, only when they write that subpoena and then make you go to court, that's when you have to answer questions. Before then, you do not have to answer questions. If this happens to you, again, what should you do? Call a lawyer, right? People think law is difficult. It's not very difficult. Call a lawyer. That's what, you do. That's what their job is, right? If your air conditioning breaks down, are you going to try to fix it? Some of you will, and you'll make it worse. Some of you, but the majority of us will just call somebody to fix the air conditioning unit. So if you are dealing in a situation where your rights are at risk, where you can be put in a very bad situation, if you say something wrong, you should hire the person whose job it is to protect your rights in that situation. So call a lawyer. And then you should follow the subpoena when and where to go to court, but still assert your right not to say anything that could be used against you in a criminal case. And then we're going to show you an actually fairly interesting video is by Muslim advocates. So just give me a moment and I'll put it online. If anybody has any questions while I'm giving this talk, please feel free to ask the questions. I mean, we're trying to make this as interactive as humanly possible. I know that when we come together in these types of situations, sometimes we're not so uh, quick to answer, ask questions. But if anybody has any questions, please let me know and I will try to answer them as, to the best of my ability. Well, Yes. What and like, let's say if they don't allow you to call to your lawyer, like you know, under that circumstances, what are you supposed to do? If they don't allow you to call to your lawyer, that's illegal, and it is a violation of your rights. And if they don't let you talk to your lawyer, you still don't have to talk to them either. And this is actually that's a good question because this happened to many people immediately after September 11th, that their rights to call a lawyer was denied from them. You don't have the right to call a lawyer. Why? Because you're a different type of threat. Right. That now has, I mean, you know, it's very good that that has now decreased and it's not uh, that much part of our government at least anymore. But immediately following September 11, that was very, very, uh, that was very, that ran rampant at that time. So this video is called You Got, Got Rights and it's made by an absolutely wonderful organization. And we'll begin. Give me a second.
just got a few questions. We're out meeting a community members, talking to people. I'm not in any trouble or anything. That's what they worried about. Beautiful home. I realize I have to get back to hear this candidate. Mike living in the car. They're fine. Difficult for Sometimes. Yeah, everyone. How's your family doing today? Life living with the current state? They're fine. Is it difficult for them? Right. Sometimes. Political life. Well, we are here involved in the community here. You're a member of the Muslim Student Association. I am Trevor. What kind of activities do you want to have? Well, playing some real soccer, barbecues at the beach. Do you know someone by the name of Keon? Did you ever see him at your MSA meeting? Uh, yes, I, I think he came to some of our meetings, but I haven't seen him in some time. I mean, he graduated about a year ago. Yes, we hear he works for the Iranian government now. How long ago? Um, about three years. And how often do you talk to Keon? Ever? Are you sure? Yes. You haven't seen him since he graduated? No. No. No, I haven't seen or talked to him in months. Ali, are you aware that lying to a federal officer is a crime? Oh, that was painful. Now, I know what a lot of you are wondering. Why would an FBI agent be interested in me? I've done nothing wrong. I have nothing to hide. Besides, I want to help law enforcement fight crime, too. Well, it's not that simple. Law enforcement sometimes engage in fishing expeditions to sniff out any hint of illegal activity. The government's list of suspicious organizations, speech, activities, and materials changes every day, so it's hard to know what might be okay one day and suspicious the next. Here are some important things to keep in mind. First, if you are contacted by law enforcement, don't answer any questions beyond giving your name, Consult an attorney immediately. Remember, the FBI investigates crimes, which include lying by omission. Funny enough, they can lie to you legally, so talking without an attorney is very risky. 
Sometimes having a lawyer is enough to deter law enforcement from contacting you again. Number two, don't let law enforcement into your home without a search warrant. If they have one, look carefully to see what the court has allowed them to search and what items they are allowed to seize. Ask what the visit is about. Take their business cards and tell them your lawyer will contact them. Remember, you don't have to answer any questions, large or not. Be polite. Also, make sure members of your family household do the same. Finally, the freedom to express your opinions, to groups, to practice your religion as you wish is an American value. So is knowing your rights. Do both. Now let's watch Ali do it right. Right here. 
Chances are you just saw some of yourself in one of the characters you just met. Now it's up to you to make sure your family and friends know their rights. 
Finally, the lawyers and Muslim advocates are interested in collecting stories like the ones you've just seen. Share the experience you've had with the FBI, Customs, or other law enforcement officials with us. It'll be held confidentially and made public only with your permission. For more information on how to protect yourself, find a lawyer, the lawyer, find a lawyer, use of media, or share your story do. with us. Is everybody still with me? Yes? Oh, wonderful. We can continue. Just a quick summary of that. What you saw is really a lot of what happened immediately after September 11 and what uh, continues to this day. So as the video indicated and showed, if the FBI comes to your house or if you know, law enforcement comes to your house asking for something, what should you do? You should step outside. Don't let them inside. Step outside. Talk to them. Ask for business cards so you can contact your lawyer and then he can contact them on your behalf. Yes. Are you supposed to give your password? When you, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So even, um, uh, let me stick on the first point, then give the second point in a second. So if they, and another reality that happens is our community, alhamdulillah, is so outgoing and is so nice and kind that when the FBI or the police come to their house, we just want to tell them everything. Where we've been, who we are, what languages we speak, what their uncles are doing, who's getting married, when they're getting married, everything. I had, um, I call a lot of our other care chapters, and one of them, she's the executive director at, um, I think, Care Ohio, and she told me the best story. So a man called her office, and he says that the FBI, they got my name, they got, you know, who I am, my numbers, all this information. So she was like, this is horrible. So then she called that agent, and she said, why? Hey, why did you ask him all these questions? Why did you get all this information? Don't you know that you can't do that? And then the FBI agent said, I didn't ask him a single thing. I just knocked on his door. He invited me and he gave me tea and he started talking for three hours. I had to tell him I have to go, right? <laughs> Think about that. And what, the, and what the law enforcement agents do is every person you mention, every person you talk about, they write them down, they keep the list, and then they'll go talk to them. So if you tell them your brother's name, they're going to go talk to your brother after they're done at your house. If you tell them this person's name, they're going to go to this person. That's what fishing expeditions are. So again, the best thing to do is if the law enforcement agents come to your house, open the door, see who it is, right? Make sure it's not somebody saying, have you seen this child, right? You, know, you do want to talk to them in that manner. But if they don't have any reason to talk to you, then just simply say, I want to talk to my lawyer and get their business card. When you're at the border, when you're coming in, the law enforcement, they do, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but I'll just give it a quick summary. They do have the right to search you, search your belongings, search your computer, and these types of things. So even if you have a phone, they can search your phone, and they can download that information. This is their right at a border. Because when you're entering a country, they have the right to make sure you're not a threat while entering that nation. Unlike when you're already living here, you're living here. So if the police come to your house, obviously, you know, you're not doing anything of that nature. So that's why they're the diff they're, that's one of the main why they're the difference. So they do have a right to do these things. What I personally do whenever I travel, and I don't travel that much, but when I do travel, all the information I have on my computer, I put it either on an external hard drive or I put it on an online source. There are sources such as Dropbox and these types of places where you can put all the information online, take it off your computer, your SIM card, right? Even that you can download it on your computer, put it online, and then when you get to where you're going, for example, Pakistan or you know anywhere you're going, then download it back onto your computer and use it like that. Because once they download all this information, they keep a record, they might then give it to another agency, which will then literally go down that list and see if any of your relatives or anybody on that list has maybe doing suspicious activities, then you're connected to them, right? So this can also happen. So yes, they do have a right to search your laptop equipment. What if, uh, and then another question that people can ask is, what if counterterrorism interview all right, so let's say now the counterterrorism force comes and they want to interview. 
a little bit about the counterterrorism force. It sounds like such a cool name, counterterrorism, right? Such a cool looking, such a cool sounding unit, counterterrorism. We fight terrorists. But you have to realize that being on counterterrorism is probably the most boring and probably the hardest position to be in. Because in the FBI, for example, you have part of the FBI that fights drugs. So how do you fight drugs? Organized drug crime. You can see the people selling drugs on the street. You can arrest them. You can see this happening. How do you fight organized crime? How do you fight corruption? You can see that happening. How do you fight terrorism? Let's say one of you were put on counterterrorism force tomorrow. How would you fight terrorism? That's a good question. So you can kind of understand that after September 11, many of these agencies, they were not made to fight terrorism. They were made to fight communism. They are made to fight other state agencies. After September 11, their, shift, their agency shifted overnight, and they had to produce results in fighting what? Terrorism. So who did they target? The Muslim community. Because who are the terrorists? Right? You really put yourself in their shoes. How would you fight terrorism? Well, there's a mosque, so maybe we should look at that mosque. You know, this is, this is the reality. And, you, and once you put yourself in their shoes, you can then realize why these actions took place immediately after September 11. Now, 10 years after, these agencies have obviously matured, they've progressed, and they've had better strategies. But immediately after September 11, they didn't really know how to do this. And there's a lot of inexperience in this field, and that's why there's many, many mistakes purposely made and accidentally made as well. So this is another way of understanding it. So again, if counterterrorism talks to you, you have the right to say you don't want to be interviewed. So they can call you up, ask to be interviewed, and you have a right to say you don't want to be interviewed. If you are interviewed, you have the right to have an attorney present. Always have a lawyer. That's the number one rule. Always have a lawyer. You also have the, t have the right to set the time and the place for the interview. So if they want to come to your house, you can say, no, let's go to Starbucks or some you know, other place. You have the right to set the time and the place for it. And you can even ask them, what question are you going to ask me before they even ask you these questions, right? So you can call them and say, what are you going to ask? And they'll give you a list. And then when you talk to them, if they ask anything outside of those questions, you, you don't have to answer them. Even before you don't, you still don't have to answer them. But if you do want to talk to them, if you do want to engage them, you can ask them questions. And then on that interview, you don't have to answer the question you don't want to. Only answer a question you're comfortable with asking and assume that everything is on record. And of course, the bottom bullet point says based on story. So I'll tell you one, a personal story of mine. While I was in college, I had a good friend of mine. And this man, he's Muslim. And he grew up in California. Uh, he grew up in California. But he, grew, he was born there. He was raised there. He doesn't know any other languages as American as you get. The FBI called him while we were at university. They called him. And they wanted an interview with this guy. So then he, of course, you know, he had no idea what his rights are. So he then went to that interview. And it was in the public place at a Chinese restaurant. And what he found out is that his MSA, back in California, many three, four years ago, that one of the members of the MSA was actually an FBI agent, right? So they actually hired an agent to be a part of their MSA. And this lady, who was part of the FBI, said, this is a person you have to look out for. So then three years later, they call this young guy who's never been out of the country, who is as American as you can get, and they call him and they question him on a one-on-one -on -one interview. And what do they want from him? They, wanted, they asked it very nicely. They said, we, if you see anything happening in your community, you should tell us about it. Or do you know anybody who could maybe be doing, and you know, I can't go into specifics, but this is how they, they want to become an informant in where we're going to school at. Right? And again, this isn't far-fetched. Not, we're not talking about something that doesn't happen. This happens to people who you probably know. And, if, and even if you need to, you can just go like five. You don't even have to go anywhere. You can just, after the salat, you can ask the people there who have been contacted by the police and FBI after September 11, and you'll see the people right there. Right? So this does happen. So now, of course, we get to the fun part. What if the law enforcement officer? So if you're arrested by law enforcement officers, they, there are different law enforcement officers. But generally, if you're arrested, the officer must read your Miranda rights. Everybody who here knows their Miranda rights? What are the Miranda rights? You have a right to stay silent, mm -hmm. and anything you say can, and you, you use against people. Exactly. And you have a right to an attorney. 
if an attorney, if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you by the state. And to be honest, the state attorneys aren't that good. So make sure you don't get a state attorney. So even if the officer doesn't tell you about those rights, you still have those rights. You have the right to remain silent. Even if they don't tell you, you still have that right. Do not tell the police anything except your name. Anything else can and what will be used against you. Why? And that's even said in the Miranda rights. It's said because you have to realize a law enforcement officer, his purpose is to find and catch criminals, right? The, in the law's eyes, you're innocent until they're proven guilty. In their eyes, they have, to, they have to prove that you're guilty. They have to find the criminals. So that's why they ask, and they deal with criminals all the time. So, you know, their demeanor and the way they deal with people is to get you to say something to prove your guilt. So you have the right to remain silent. And this is a right given to you by the law of this country. See a lawyer immediately. You have a right to a phone call. And everybody should definitely take this right. It should be understood that if you call somebody, if you call your home or your family, or anybody, the law, the law enforcement officer has the right to listen into that call. If you call your lawyer, they do not have the right to listen to that call. So if you call Abu at home, they can listen to that call. If you call your lawyer, they can't listen to it. Why? And there's many reasons. One simple reason I'll give for all of you, because I had this asked another time, is that let's say there's a, a bad guy, a criminal, and he's a drug dealer. All right, he's going to call. Who's he going to call? His partner. Hey, yo, bad, they got me. You know, get rid of the drugs. So that's why the law <laughs> enforcement, they'll monitor you. If you call the lawyer and you tell, hey, lawyer, get rid of my drugs, they obviously not going to do that, right? So this is one of many reasons, and um, just to keep that in mind, that if you call your family, the law enforcement officer can monitor, and he will monitor it. If you call your lawyer, they don't have the right to monitor that conversation. If you're treated badly, this happens, and this might happen to somebody you know, and this is something that you shall be aware of. If you are treated badly, the golden rule is document, document, document. Get the officer's badge number, his name, any identification, and any identifying information, find witnesses and their names, and get their numbers. And if you're injured, seek medical attention immediately. All right, let me say again. Get the officer's badge number, his name, any identifying information, find witnesses, their names and numbers, and if injured, seek medical attention. I have so many stories of people who have been treated badly by the law. And they'll not give, they might, they haven't given me a call, but they'll give other, you know, care chapters a call. And they'll say, this happened, this happened, this happened. And then the care person will say, all right, who did it? He's like, I, I don't know. I, I didn't get his name. I didn't get his bad number. I have no idea what agency I was at. I have no information. And when did this happen? Three years ago. By that time, it's too late. So you have to react quickly. You also need to document, because we're not telepathic people, right? If we don't know who did this to you, then there's nothing we can do about this. There's uh, one case here where a brother, he got pulled over and there might have been a case where the officer actually took his, the money that was in his car and he didn't report it to the agency, so he just took that money and he didn't report it. Now this brother, he never ever called the law, he never called care, he never did anything to get justice. And now it's been months and months, so now he can't really get justice anymore. So this can also happen. So make sure you act quickly and make sure you get some information. If somebody hits you, hits your car, what's the first thing you get? That person's name, his license. So why is it that if somebody hits your car, which is a less of offense, that if the police treat you badly, that you don't take that to the same level, right? Just, you know, and use that sort of sense. Searches and warrants. Can law enforcement officers search my house or office? They can search your home only with consent. So if they come to your house, and you give them consent to come in, then of course they can search your home. If, the, if you are away, police can search your home if a family member or guest says they can. So if the police come to your house and one of your children answers the door, and they say, hi, how you doing, can we search your house? And your kid says yes, then they can search your house. If you have a friend over, right? If you have a friend over and he says you can search the house, you can, they can search your house, right? And when they search your house, they don't do it in a nice sort of, you know, let's look at this. A search is something done, and it, I mean, there are different types of searches, of course. But the worst type of search is when they tear up everything in your house, they destroy the inside of your house to find any sort of material. So this can also happen. So make sure that your friend and family know that you don't want anybody to search your house. They can also search your house if they have a warrant. 
What is a warrant? It's a piece of paper signed by a judge giving permission to enter a home or other building and allows law enforcement officers to enter a place that is described in the warrant and look for items that are also described in that warrant. This is what a warrant looks like. It will have your name on it, it will have your address on it, it will have the judge's name on it, it will also have a time and date and items that are to be searched. Right? I don't know if everybody can see it, let me turn off the light. All right, so this is a warrant. Where is it? State of North Carolina, search warrant, time, date, address, judge's name, everything. This is what a warrant looks like. The police, they can, and sometimes they do. They don't have a warrant. They just give you a piece of paper and say, this is our search warrant. And a person not knowing any better, okay, you have a warrant, search my house. This is what a warrant. If they don't have these, this information on the warrant, that means they cannot search your house. Now, of course, there's a trick. If they get the wrong date or something like that, that's not a big deal, right? As long as they have the judge's information in your address. But it is something you have to be aware of. That if the police say, I have a warrant, you stop. You don't let them come in. You first say, let me see the warrant. You get the warrant, and then you let them in. If you have a house, and the police come here, and they say, you want to search your house, you open the door a little bit, get the warrant, and then you close the door. Don't let them inside. Because, really, if the police come inside your house, they will... I mean, they can do a lot of things inside your house to find those sort of things. So this is what a warrant looks like. What you need to know is that it's a piece of paper that says warrant doesn't mean it's an arrest warrant. So there are two types of warrants. One is a search warrant. The other is an arrest warrant. So if you are have an arrest warrant, it's different than a search warrant. An arrest warrant means that you, the police now have a, a right to arrest you, to take you to their station and to hold you in custody. So that's what a, a arrest warrant is. If an officer knocks, as I said, rather than open the door, ask through the door if they have a warrant. And you know, if they don't have a warrant, then ask. If they don't have a warrant, then you don't have to let them come in. If a warrant is not complete, do not let them in and call lawyer ASAP. That means that they, for whatever reason, are gunning it. They want to come into your house, or, you know, and you need to call a lawyer immediately. While the search is going on, and like I said, searches can range, and the worst search is when they literally tear apart everything in your house, and they will go through every speck of it. If this is going on, you do not have a right to stop that search from happening. Even if they give you a warrant, and this is the next slide, oh no. Even if they give you a warrant, and the warrant is complete, but they come in anyway, you don't have the right to physically stop them, right? You don't have the right to physically stop them. They will come in, you can physically stop them, but you do have a right to try to get their name, the badge number, the agency, and what they took. Document, document, document. And this is if they come in without a warrant, you know, you can't stop them, but make sure you document who they are and what they're taking. This is my, my favorite part, right at the airport. And this is a cartoon, I have a few of these cartoons. This cartoon shows that in the future, no more metal detector. They'll just put your entire body through the scanner, right? Or you put your suitcases that they scan it. You'll just lay down, and they'll put you in it as well. I guess they've already created something like that with the full body scanners, which are a violation of your rights, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. Rights at the airport and other ports of entry. As an airline passenger, you are entitled to a courteous, respectful, and non-stigmatizing treatment by the airline and security personnel. They cannot stop, search, detain, or remove you based solely on race, religion, national origin, sex, or ethnicity. I say this, but this does happen. The way you stop this from happening in airports is that, let's say I go to the airport and I get stopped. And let's say this you know, young man here, he goes to the airport and he gets stopped. Then this guy goes, he gets stopped. Then that guy goes, he gets stopped. Then, if we record all of our incidences and we keep a track of this, you can then turn it in, file a suit to that airport, and say clearly there's an act of discrimination going on here. But as a community, many of us, we, for whatever reason, this guy gets stopped, he gets stopped, that person gets stopped, and these people, they just all take it. And nobody realizes that unless you, if unless myself, you, all of you that get stopped at the airport, they have to document it, they have to file a suit against it, and once you file a suit, then you can prove that this airport is discriminating based on religion, ethnicity, and that's how you stop that from happening. Yes? Okay, let's say you're on the line, four people are ahead of you when you're stopped. When it comes to you, you're addressing Islam, who will be stopped, you can you? say anything against that, and can you ask why those people will not stop? 
you can, and if uh, the question was, if you're in line, and they let one person go, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, your turn, you're wearing hijab, I'm sorry ma'am, random search, right? This does happen. So what do you do? You can ask why you're being searched. It, well, let me first say this. If you're stopped random search, whether it's right or wrong, they still have the right to search you. So you can't stop that from happening, all right? You have to allow them to search you. But you do have the right to ask why it's being happening, why it's happening, though they might not give you an answer. And you do have the right to ask the person who's searching you the name the, and then document it as well. And I'll give you a real life example. This didn't happen to Muslims, this actually happened in Chicago. The, uh, well, the incident was that there were people, African American ladies, coming from Jamaica for vacation, of course. And they were coming out to the United States. Every lady, African American descent, that came from Jamaica to the United States would be stopped, regardless. American, you went to Jamaica, you were stopped. This was going on for many, many, many months. Then one day, one lady, after so many months, she finally stopped. And not only were they stopping them, but they were strip searching them. It wasn't a radio, so they were strip searching the ladies as well. So after this happened, one of the ladies, she complained, and she went to the radio, and she complained on the radio. After she complained on the radio, other ladies, African-American ladies in that city, they also came out and they said this had happened to us as well when we went to Jamaica and we were also African-American. They then filed a suit together. You know, you can file class action suits together as well. And they filed that suit and because of that, they found that the airport was not only in violation of that discrimination, but they found they're in violation of other discrimination suits as well. And because of that, the law, that agency, that airport, was then not investigated, but then they changed their policy and they stopped that from happening. The reality is, is that if you don't complain, if you don't document, and you don't file suit, if this happens, then it's going to keep happening. And this is just the reality. Yes? I'm sorry to interrupt no, no. you. I don't know if this is the same issue like what you said. Okay, we have a group of ladies going on different routes. You know, we are all coming from Isna, and we get to the airport. Each of us was stopped. Individually. And that is a clear indication. And were you stopped and other people weren't stopped? Other people weren't stopped. Every lady, you know, wearing, wearing a job. You know, then this is something that clearly, um, what you should do, and I don't know if you did this, if you and those other ladies would document it and then get a case together and actually file it against, I guess, O'Hare Airport. I would assume it's O'Hare Airport. This is the best and the only real way you can stop that from happening. If all of you do nothing, if there's 10 of you and all of you do nothing, then nothing is going to happen, right? So, um, you know, that does happen and that's something that can be stopped. I'm actually going to continue just because we are running out of time. If entering the U.S. with a valid papers, can law enforcement officers stop and search me? Yes, law enforcement officers, even if you have an airport, can stop. Passport, they can stop and search you. Customs have a right to stop, detain, and search any person or item. Non-citizens should carry their green cards. And law enforcement can ask about immigration status. They do have a right to determine whether you have the permission to enter the U.S. or not. And the border, they're more strict because you're entering the country. So we should understand that as well. Can law enforcement officers search my laptop? This issue it was contested and still is somewhat contested. Generally, they can search your laptop files. And they can be happy with the information side of them. Remember that if they take your laptop, just in that video, to document who took it, his name, his supervisor name, how long they took it, and what files were copied as well. Docu documentation, the key. If, you, we, if we don't know what happened, then it's as if nothing happened. If you don't document it, then it's, it's, it's you know, you, you bear that burden. Religious covering. At the airport, you have a right to a religious head covering, and you have the right to assert that right. If an alarm goes off while wearing hijab or turban, so you go to a metal detector and the alarm goes off, then they may use the wand, though they don't use that anymore. They can use the wand to determine whether it's coming from your topi, your turban, or your hijab. If it is coming from there, then they can search it. Or if you want, you can search it for them. You can like open up, put your hands on, you can also search it for them. And this is done through a pat-down. It should be meant that a strip search is not a normal routine search, and it must be supported by reasonable suspicion and in a private area. So this is something that has happened, doesn't happen as much, but you know, this one you have to keep in mind as well. Um, there are also, right now, the big problem in our day is the full body scanners. Right, the full body scanner. The full body scanners are <coughs> scanners which you stand in front of and they take a photo of you through your clothes and they get a human being, you know, completely, 
and we have children miles here. You know, completely naked. That's what the full body scanner is. You have the right not to go through that. You don't have to go through the full body scanner, and I recommend many of you don't go through that scanner. It has been linked to potential health problems. It has been linked to many issues. One of the biggest, I mean, one reason I can give you just out of modesty, all right, they take a picture of you, then they delete those pictures. Sometimes there have been cases where they don't delete those pictures. They keep those pictures of thousands of people. But let's say they delete those pictures. When you go through that scanner, that picture is then put on a computer by the agent. That agent can be either a man or a woman. It's not like all the men's pictures go to one side and all the ladies' pictures go to the other side, man or woman. So if I'm a man and there's a woman back there, she sees me completely in that situation. And many times it's men, and when the women go in, the women bodies are also exposed. So this is something that you have to understand. You don't have to go through that. This itself, and this is getting maybe outside of our course, this was introduced after the underwear bomber, which was a man who tried to blow up an airplane by having explosives in his underwear. And this is why they got this full body scanner. It must be understood that the full body scanner is really another way for certain organizations to make a lot of money through this fear that's going on. Because each one of those scanners is extremely expensive and there are lobbyists trying to put one. If you're part of that org corporation who makes those scanners, you want one in every airport. Why? Because every you want your airplanes to be safe. But they, do they really care about safety? You know, we don't really know. But in the end, there is money behind it. That's why they put it in every single airport. And that's why they're pushing it so much. You do not have to go through that. Interrogation on a plane. If you're flying, a pilot has the right to refuse to fly a passenger if he or she believes the passenger is a threat to the safety of the flight. But it must be a reasonable, th reasonable and based on observations of you, not stereotypes. In May 7, 2011, how many people heard this story that Delta flight power refused to fly two Muslims who were religious leaders and they were kicked off of a domestic flight when the Delta airline pilot refused to fly them. Does anybody remember the story? Yeah, was it from Florida to North Carolina somewhere? Yeah, yeah. and the, it, was, it was from that and these two Muslims were actually going to a conference about Islamoph how do you combat Islamophobia in the United States. How ironic, right? A pilot has the right to not fly you if they have a reasonable reason, a reasonable issue to do this. But yet, a reasonable issue is not because of the way you dress, it's not because of the way you look. So the pilot had a right to not fly them, but the reason he didn't fly them was because they were Muslims and they were dressed the way they were. And this itself, though, I mean, of course, this isn't the legality of it, is not just for him to do that. They can't not fly, you know, me because I wear a dopey or anything. That's not right. If I'm dangerous, right, if there's a reason to assume that, then they cannot fly me. A good example could be in Egypt. Uh, everybody heard about the Egyptian revolution. So Mubarak, the president of Egypt, was trying to get out of Egypt, right? He was trying to get out of Egypt, and then the airline pilot, he refused to fly Mubarak, right? So this is one of those situations where an airline pilot can assert that right. But for this situation, unfortunately, it was done through um, uh, bad reasons. The no-fly list, or the national security list, everybody, every Muslim, it's like an honor stash to be on the no-fly list nowadays. Or at least for the young Muslims, it's like something cool. You know, I know about the no-fly list. What is the no-fly list? The no-fly list is a list of sus suspects, and even on your, I didn't bring a ticket, I could have shown you. Even on tickets, there are actually numbers written that would assert that you're on the no-fly list. And then there are different colors you can also check as well. The no-fly list means that you will be search extra because you are a suspect in something. Who gets put on the no-fly list? How do you got, how do people get put on the no-fly list? First of all, some of this can be done through those fishing expeditions. So the FBI agent that came to your uncle's house, and your uncle, he served in TA Tartar for three hours, and he got your name, your cousin's name, this guy's name, that guy's name, they can all be then put on the no-fly list. They can also be put on the no-fly list depending on where you've been in the past, and really, there's no clear-cut paper where you can read that said, if you do this, you'll be part of the no-fly list. It's not known. And that list, even if it was known, changed any, every year. If you feel you're on the no-fly list unjustly, unlike what Muslims think, you can get off the no-fly list. You can get off the no-fly list. You can get off the no-fly list. It's not impossible. We're not dealing with... I don't know. Our, sometimes, as most times, we think that if something's happening, there's nothing you can do to combat it. I'm on the no-fly list, I can never get out. The FBI comes to my house, they're never going to stop coming to my house. 
This is not true. So if you're on the no-fly list, what you can do is you can contact the Transportation Security Administration and file an inquiry, which is paperwork that you file using the travel redress inquiry process. And then, of course, here's our the, um, uh, website you can go to. It's paperwork you file. The government will then look into it, find that you don't deserve to be on the no-fly list, and they'll take you off. Or you can contact the ACLU and go to no-fly complaint, and you can also do that as well. If you're singled out because of race, we're almost done, don't worry. If you're singled out because of race or religion, it's important to record the details while they're fresh in your memory. Not note the airplane, the airport, the airline, flight number, the names and badges. So remember, document, 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 especially if you're at the airport. And then the numbers of law enforcement officers involved, information on any airline or airport personnel involved, questions that were asked in interrogation, stated reason for treatment, types of searches conducted, and length and conditions of the detention as well. And then underneath is actually another uh, website you can go to for the, if you're discrimination or singled out. And maybe that's somewhere that you should go to. Can I give to charity, charitable donations, and uh, what about my religious practice? So if you are part of a masjid, and if you are a Muslim, you have the right to donate to charities that you feel are beneficial to the world. You have a right to donate to charities. And you can give to charity organization without becoming a terror suspect, right? And yes, you, you, you should continue to give money to causes you believe in, but be careful in choosing what charity to support. We'll kind of get that in a second. As a community, and this is something that's very um, prominent and prevalent, that there's paranoia within our communities. Paranoia in giving to certain charities because you assume that if I gave to this charity, then you are going to be held accountable. The FBI is going to come after you. The CIA is going to come after you. We are, we, uh, I'll, if I give a fictional example, let's say you want to hold an event at a local mosque. And it can be contested. It might be going to an area that might have political turmoil. It might be a problem. The mosque out of fear or that organization out of fear will not want you to do this program. Why? Because they think the FBI or other organizations are going to go after you. And this is really is not the case. Sometimes in the United States there are 285,000 nonprofit organizations. And the FBI, CIA, and these organizations, they don't have the time, resource, and energy to look into all 285,000 and provide you a list of, yes, this is good to donate. They do have a list of, of organizations that you should not donate to, which are linked to terrorist organizations and governments that are against the United States. But big organizations like Islamic Relief, Ikhna Relief, you know, Helping Hands, these types of bigger Red Cross, Red Crescent, these organizations are okay to donate, so do continue to donate to these organizations. And yes, you have the right to worship as you want, and this is a constitutional right. You have the right to go to the place of worship, attend and hear the sermons and religious lectures, participate in community activities, and pray in public. The law is on your side. So you have the right to come to the mosque, you have the right to pray here, you have the right to listen to what the imam is saying, and you have the right to pray outside in public places. You have the right to pray outside in public places. You have this right to do that. Of course, you can't go to your neighbor's house. And if you don't want you to pray on this property, you can't pray there. Right? But if, and in a park, you can pray in a park. On a government facility, you can pray in the government facilities. And this is actually another fear that's in our community that as Muslims, after September 11, we sometimes get so afraid we don't want to pray even in public places. I remember I was at Merrimack University, uh, Merrimack Community College, and it was time for Dohar. So we got the brother, we were praying in the library. The library allows us to pray. The security there allows us to pray. Everybody's okay with us praying, except the Muslim who was there, one of the brothers who was there, he said, you guys can't pray here. You can't pray here, what are you doing? Don't you know what these people are gonna say? They're gonna call the, they're gonna think you're Osama bin Laden. You're thinking you're like Al Qaeda guys. You're, they think, you know, and this is not the people, the library's okay with it. The campus security's okay with it. But yet this guy, he's not okay with it. He's a Muslim guy, why? Because paranoia. Paranoia is something that grips our community nowadays. And it grips us at the community college, it grips us everywhere. My brother, he was trying to play at UMSL. And again, the library's okay with it, the security guard's okay with it. One of the students at uh, UMSL library, he was not okay with it. So he went up to them and started creating, creating problems, he started saying, you know, why are you guys praying you don't have a right to pray here? So then who came to the Muslim's aid? The security officer at the library came and he told that student, you don't have a right to say this, you, you should actually leave. So think about that. Don't fall into paranoia. 
And as a community, we fall into paranoia, we fall into this a lot, and you know, it's better not to fall into this. Job discrimination, we're not going to get finished with this last year, I just realized. I will go as far as you can. So this is another one of my cartoons, I love these cartoons. You might be the best man for the job, but I have a dozen women who are better qualified. Get it? So the job discrimination, a man wants to get a job, but there are a dozen women who are better qualified, because they're women. So, uh, <laughs> when faced with job discrimination, we'll go through this kind of quickly. Remain calm and polite. Inform the offending party, whether it's your boss, whether it's a coworker, that what you're doing is job discrimination, or you're acting in a discriminatory manner. Report the discrimination that day, the day after, and take action in writing, and call the company management. The good thing about the United States is that every company has a hierarchy. So your manager might be discriminatory against you, but his boss, their company's going to lose money because of this. So do report these cases. And there's a case by Abercrombie and Fitch, I won't go into it. Document, 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 keep memos, keep details of what happened, and keep witnesses of what happened. Contact CARE, contact ACLU, contact Equal Op Employment Opportunity Commission as well. Do not, do not, do not sign any documents. Let's say your, your uh, employer discriminates against you, your manager discriminates against you. Then he says sign this, and then we can continue. Then we can continue with this case. Do not sign that, because many times they'll tell you to sign something that in itself will take away your rights as an employer. And it, it, there's many forms that they can sign, and the way lawyers write forms is always double speak. You think it means one thing, but it says something else, right? So don't sign anything. And equally important, do not resign from your position. We just had a case of a man, and I know we're out of time, but we just had a case of a man who was experiencing job discrimination for months, months. And then he called CARE, and then we, you know, of course, contacted the ACLU. Before we were able to file a case action, he resigned from his post. And you know what? The moment you resign from your post, is that job discrimination anymore? No. No. If they, if they ask you to resign, it's, you don't have to resign. If they fire you, that's something else. And then that, of course, can be put in the suit as well. That not only were they discriminatory, but then they fired me because of my religion. But if they ask you to resign, do not resign. Be patient, be patient. And it's not easy. I say this verbally, but it's so difficult. When you're working and every day you know the manager's going to treat you like this. Or your co-worker's going to act like this. And it's very difficult. right? So I'm saying this right now to you, but it's okay. so difficult in real life. So do not resign. Yes? They, they bring me to a conference meeting, they say you cannot return to work. They need you to resign. Mm. We'll talk about that later. And that's something we should talk to a lawyer about, actually. Yeah. All right, student rights. This is the last one. Student, I love this picture. <laughs> I don't teach my students about the Bill of Rights anymore. Why? It just makes them unruly, right? <laughs> the more the students know about their rights, the more unruly they become. So the teacher stopped teaching them. Students' rights, this is the last slide, we'll run through it very quickly. As students, some of you are students, you have the right to inform others about your religion. You have the right to pass out literature or speak to others about Islam as long as it's done in not a disruptive manner. You have the right to wear religious clothing at school. You also have the right to wear clothing with a religious message. So like, Islam is awesome. I, I don't know, you, you can wear that. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as your clothes with similar messages are allowed. You have the right to organize student-led prayers on the campus as long as the service is not destructive to the function of the school. I'm still so sorry, that's my brother's story that I just said. You may have the right to attend Friday prayers. The Supreme Court has upheld the right for, of states to allow students to be released to attend religious classes or services. In some communities, the students leave on Juma and they'll come and pray here at Jumma, or they have a Jumma, I mean the fry sermon at the school itself. And the school does allow this, and um, you know, just keep that in mind as well. So if you have students going to school, and you want them to pray Jumma there, you know, just talk to the school board. Many times they'll allow you to, so it won't create a problem, just talk to them about it. You have the right to be excused from school for religious holidays, and you should be sure to inform the school in advance that you'll be absent. I love this last one, because I'm sure my parents didn't know about this while I was growing up. During Eid, uh, at least me for this. We'll end with a joke, I think. Uh, student rights. Oh, we'll end with this. This will be a joke. But what, during Eid, my parents, they'll let me go out to pray the morning prayer and then go back to school, right? Because they didn't understand that you could actually get the entire day off because it was a holiday. But now we understand that. I'm going to end with this photo. This is a photo of me. But every community has this guy in it. The guy who says, oh, brother, brother, 
You should, you should tell the FBI everything. Why are you talking? What do you mean have a lawyer first? What do you mean don't talk to the police? You'll have it in every community. The one guy who says completely opposite of what the legal organizations say. No, if the FBI comes to my house, I talk to them. You know, I want to talk to them. And if you don't talk to them, that's wrong. Everybody has, every community has this. And these people are dangerous in the community. Because there have been people, and we can give you cases, and I didn't bring any cases, but there have been people who have been sent to jail for years because they're pulled over for a speeding ticket, and then next, because of what they said, they're fired, they were filed for terrorist claims, then they were sent to jail for years. And there's nothing wrong with that person. This happens multiple, multiple times. And people in our community, if you know anybody like this, who says that, no, you should talk to the police, you talk to the FBI, you, you don't have anything to hide, so just talk to them. These people are dangerous. And so many people's lives have been destroyed, have been, they've been sent to jail, their rights have been taken away because of this type of thinking and this type of attitude. And it's very imperative that now you, that all of us here know what our rights are, that you have to defend these rights now for yourself before the community around you. And you shouldn't listen to like this guy right here, right? Even though it's me, but you should listen to me, not this guy, like the fictional this guy. That these type of people who say, the only, I mean, for example, I'll give you a real example. Remember when I told you the story about my friend in Iowa who was called by the FBI, right? I told the story to somebody else about you know how wrong it was that the FBI called him and how bad it was. You know what that person said? Well, the FBI, they must have had a reason why they called him. They must have had a reason. They just don't call people out of the blue. So again, what did they do? Rather than saying that the FBI made a mistake and they're fishing and this is against the rights and the laws of the land, they said it's this guy's fault. It's the Muslim guy's fault, right? This, and we probably know many cases of this. So again, I want to end with this, that do not fall into this type of trap, man. And of course, get involved locally. But with that, inshallah, we'll call it to an end. We have five minutes until Isha. Does anybody have any questions or comments or concerns? We'll just wrap it up like this. Can you distribute